Hey, I want to welcome everybody to edition number three of Pro Mindset Retake. And we've got today Brock Doman as a guest. He's uh, my youngest son, and he is the quarterback at University of Louisville by way of a handful of schools before he landed at Louisville. Brock, this last season, uh, got his first Power 5 start against Virginia in Charlottesville. Got an opportunity to start four games, win a bowl game. Got an opportunity to play a full half against Clemson. Brock, welcome to Pro Mindset tonight. Yes, sir. Woo-hoo! Things started. Okay, so we talk a lot about playing in your heart and not in your head. Why don't you describe um, for our audience what that means to you? What does playing out of your heart mean and living out of your heart and performing out of your heart instead of being in your head? Um, it's connecting to the original dream that you had as a kid because desire comes every single day we desire things all the time all day every day but that always washes away but what doesn't wash away is the things that God has put on your heart that no matter how much you try to push away or let go of they just somehow stick so I'd say playing out of your heart is connecting to your inner child um, playing out of your heart is connecting to this energy within you that has always been there from the jump. So we should rename this podcast Pro Heart Set Podcast. Heart set. Yeah, because it's really about Pro, your heart. Yeah, Pro Heart Set. Pro Heart Set. Yeah, you got it wrong. Whew. Okay, so isn't it ironic to have the best mindset you got to play out of your heart? Yeah, it's very... Weird. Okay, so let's go back to October of 2022. And you are running out on the field in Charlottesville, Virginia, Mm -hmm. getting your first Power 5 start. And before the game even started, what is the feeling that you had in in your body, in your mind, in your heart? Describe the adrenaline, the, you know, just the feeling of, I'm doing it. This is my shot. This is my opportunity. Describe what that was like. It was the most insane feeling ever. Like I felt like I felt like I was in such a different world. Like I was just for like 12 hours leading up to the game, I just feel like I was blacked out in my own body of just like playing out Everything it took to get to this point. Um, And then just the heightened energy within me was, I feel like I was just buzzing. Like there was so much going on internally because of how excited I was. So it was honestly really tough to deal with. Like really tough. I constantly had to remind myself that nervousness and anxiousness is just the body's way of prepping prepping itself to be able to withstand four hours of going to war and having that level of focus, like there's a reason why something builds up within you beforehand. And it's actually to help you, not to hinder you. And so it's just all about how how you view that energy pregame. So what did you do that week that might have been different than what you do on other weeks? And what was your routine to make sure that you were totally locked in once that game started, what what kind of practices did you do? What'd you do? You know, uh, what'd you do in the in the hotel on game day? You know, what'd you do in the locker room before you ran out on the field? What are some of the things that you did? Um, I really made sure I got a lot of rest because um, there was just so much going on the entire week, like internally, and then obviously all these people reaching out, knowing that I'm about to play. Um, the best way to combat all that is like getting eight to 10 hours of sleep. So I really got a lot of sleep that week. And then, you know, every waking moment, you know, watching film, um, studying your plays, um, doing a lot of breath work, doing a lot of stretching. Um, yeah, I would say the main things, the main thing I did that week was just a crap ton of breath work, especially before the game. Um, 
I think what I do differently than a lot of other players is a lot of other players, you know, put on their headphones or bumping to music. I like being extremely quiet. Like I just sit in my locker and I don't listen to anything and I just focus on being still because I know that I'm about to have a crap ton of thoughts um, and, and a crap ton of processing that I have to do out on the field. So if I can be still beforehand, I feel like it allows me to play from my heart and not from my mind because um, also there's so much mental um, straining that goes on for a quarterback in a game. As you know, the amount of times I've come home after practice and been like, I'm mentally exhausted. Um, and so pregame, I try to give my brain a break. Just think of nothing. So we just had the NFL draft over the weekend, mm-hmm. and Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud and Anthony Richardson, the name, the first three quarterbacks that were drafted, are going to get an opportunity probably sooner rather than later to get their first start in the NFL. Um, what do you think they? What do you think? I mean, what is going through their head, and what was going through your head when you're watching those guys get drafted on Thursday night? as a player that aspires to be in that situation. Um, just some of your thoughts about your future. They're, they're present. They're, they're there now. And how do you think they should approach it to be successful? And how would you approach it for you to be successful? successful? Yeah, I think that specifically in Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud's situation, they were blessed to be in programs like Alabama and Ohio State where – um, they're they're going to be ready to go. Like day one, week one, they'll be ready to go. Um, the way those programs are set up, you get so much help uh, mentally to prepare for the NFL because um, every single year those, those two schools are pumping out guys. So those guys, I think, are really, really prepared. And I think that it's just a continuation of what they're doing. Um but everyone else, the Anthony Richardsons, the Will Levises, the all the other guys that got drafted, it is going to be a wake up call. It's going to be there's going to have to be an, another level of intensity in their routines. I think there's another level of pressure that they have on themselves because um, they were just a man and um, colleges. I would say a lot easier than the NFL in the sense of, you know, when you're the man, there's no worries about scholarship getting taken away. There's no worry about someone else coming in to take your spot where the NFL, it's a lot more ruthless, I'd say. So dealing with that new level of comparison, um, maybe insecurity, like with every new level, like I thought I was really, really confident in myself. And then once I um, got the scholarship to Louisville, all these unconscious insecurities came out that once didn't exist, I thought didn't exist. So that's what's happening to a lot of those guys is um, with the new level of confidence and, and the reassurance from their spirit, like, hey, I just got drafted. So one end of it, it's like the biggest confidence boost ever. And on the flip side of it, whatever unconscious insecurities they have, um, because they reach this new level, will come out. Um, and the best thing, and putting myself in their shoes and like how I would prepare if I just got drafted, um, it would be first and foremost like connecting with as many people as I can in the organization. Because you are the quarterback, like getting familiar with people and, and starting to build those relationships is what's going to allow you to stay in the building. Um, So getting there as soon as possible. You know, I know it's probably nice to be able to celebrate with your family and soak in this moment, but it's really just like a split-second transition into what you need to do to continue to be on the team. Um, And then just it's all about first impressions. So... um, as, as best as you can, like staying way longer than you need to be in the facility and just like letting them know like 
you know, I didn't just get my money and I'm good. Like, I'm going to earn every penny of this and kind of set in the tone for your whole career. I mean, that's that's the main thing is like how, every single one of them, they, sh- they should be thinking about how can I set the tone to myself, to my teammates, to this organization, to the fan base on how this career is going to go. Because, it, you know, it's not a developmental league. So, better be ready. Well, one thing that is very, very true is that the NFL draft is an awesome weekend full of excitement and heartbreak, disappointment, all this stuff. But it really doesn't matter now. It's gone. It's mm-hmm. over. Now mm-hmm. it's about building your career, uh, winning over your team, getting command of your playbook, and being able to lead men on the field against guys that are really talented, that are making a lot of money, that are trying to stop you. And when you face adversity, you're going to face adversity. Every rookie does. Uh, Troy Aikman went 1-15. Mm. Um, Peyton Manning went 3-13. and 13. You know, a um, lot of adversity there. Uh, can you overcome that? And the media's putting doubts out there that maybe they didn't pick the right guy. Yeah. Well, in the, and I had a thought about quarterback at the Power 5 level, which I'm at, and the NFL level, is all about decisiveness. And decisiveness only comes when you have an extreme level of preparation and you have an extreme level of like deep trust in yourself and in your teammates. Because if you're overthinking anything, any type of decision you're making, anything you're seeing as a quarterback, your ass is grass. Um, and I saw that in my play last year. It was like any time I was in alignment with myself, with my team, with the play call, man, we were hitting on all cylinders. But any time... There's any little indecisiveness, any little questioning of why is he calling this play or, um, you know, does the defense know this because we run this a lot or whatever little thought comes up to try to persuade you to overthink it, um, that's when bad things happen. And in the NFL, um, they might know what you're going to do because of how much film study they do, because of how... Um, incredibly smart defensive players are nowadays. So, okay, even if they know what I'm going to do because I'm the one doing it and because of the fluidity that I've practiced with and the level of speed I've practiced with, as long as you're decisive, you can still be effective. Well, one of the things that screams at me when you're talking like that is that the guys that know who they are, the guys that believe in who they are, the guys that think that they're enough. They have worthiness. Mm -hmm. They love themselves. They believe in themselves. They can handle anything. And the guys that are like 99.9ers, not 100% sure that this is going to go great, it's going to go great until it doesn't go great. Mm -hmm. And whether it's an injury, whether it's a three interception game, or whether it's a pick six to lose a game in in the two-minute drill, then they crack. Or they get... They get, they get sacked too much. I mean, David Carr got sacked too much. It, it kind of ruined his career. So the only way to survive is to know who you are. Fair? Fair. Okay. Fair, and that's going to be tested every single game. Every day. Every day. Um, your own teammates are going to test you. Your coaches are going to test you. Yeah, and, and there's, really, there's really no room for error in the sense of, you're getting the recognition. You're getting the money. With that comes you. If if a left tackle you know misses an assignment, we can work through it. If a linebacker misses an assignment, we can work through it. But if it's you know fourth and five, games on the line, and you're not trusting it, and we don't convert, and it's because of the quarterback's fault. Like, that's not really something you can work through as a team because it's already hard enough to get the other 10 to do their job really well. And so the quarterback has such a higher level of efficiency he has to be on because he has to make up for if one of the 10 doesn't, you know, do their job correctly. We still are expected to 
be effective in that situation. So if all 10 are doing their job and you're not, you're not going to be in the league for that long. So um, well, I would say putting, that, putting that accountability on yourself. Absolutely. Accountability is a good word. I would say that the coaches design the plays so that the quarterback can make a good decision regardless of what happens. Yeah. What breakdown, what what somebody, when your left tackle does get beat, your right guard gets beat, your middle of Middle of pocket pressure doesn't matter. You you've got yeah, and, answers for everything that might happen. So ultimately, because the ball's in your hands, the whole team and the and the coaching staff is expecting you to make a good decision. Yeah, and I'm happy you brought that up. And that's what I mean by effective. Effective might be throwing the ball away. Like that's still a great play. And so there's just no room for error of making the wrong decision because of how amazing offenses are structured nowadays, there's literally a decision, a right decision for every single situation. And so because we have, it's not like there's one right answer because there's so many right answers. We are expected to make one of the correct right answers. Okay. So you've got a new coach, Scott Satterfield defected Louisville and went to Cincinnati uh, Jeff Brom came back to his hometown and his home, his alma mater and brought um, a lot of the coaching staff from Purdue. And he brought in a transfer portal quarterback from Cal Berkeley that used to play with him for four years um, at Purdue, Jack Plummer. So you've been competing for the uh, quarterback position against Jack and you know four or five other quarterbacks. Um, kind of share how that's gone, um, where you're at, how did you approach it, um, certainly Jack had the upper hand because, you know, those guys went in his living room in, in uh, Arizona when he was a high school kid and convinced him to come to Purdue. Um, but how do, how do you handle that? Because as a quarterback, almost every quarterback out there faces similar situations like you're facing right now where you may not, it might be a fair competition, but it may not be a fair competition, but you still got to go compete and be ready to go regardless. Yeah, so I was actually going to leave Louisville unless a new coaching staff came in. So I'm very, very grateful that the Brahms came in. Um, such an amazing system to be under. Like, it is an NFL offense. It truly is. There's so many options on every single play. It truly has grown my neuroplasticity in my brain from learning this offense. Like, at first, it was so overwhelming, and, and now that I have a good grip on it, which I'm going to continue to work to get deeper into it, um, it has brought so much joy to me playing in the offense because um, there's this new level of confidence I have out on the field of like, because of the play designs, like of how much more effective I can be. Um, when it comes to how have I dealt with the mindset of working through this new competition. Um, it's been a lot different. Um, last year, I definitely had some strengths that the other quarterback didn't have. And so, um, but then I also dealt with that. I knew that there wasn't a competition. And so breaking through that was really, really huge for me in my confidence in, in my Lord and Savior and in my confidence in myself. Um, because I very well could have not played a single down last year. Um, and so that confidence has rolled over into this year. Just knowing that, you know, when God has placed something in your life, um, and when he anoints you that it's going to come to pass and I feel anointed and I have always have been. And, um, circumstantially again, it has been tough because, um, Jack has an amazing understanding of the offense. Um, he's very efficient in it, and he's, he's a damn good quarterback. So it's been awesome to, to learn from him, to compete against him. Um, you know, he's a good dude as well. So I think we, all of us in the QB room, specifically Jack, Conley, and I, we all um, have really good ball talk together, and we're all, you know, getting extra hours in watching film together. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been really cool to see that I can be friends with the people I'm competing with and genuinely have like a mutual respect for each other. 
Um, I think that it has made me find a even deeper level, which every year I'm dumbfounded by the fact that there's, there's even more levels to this game called life. And I think every time you reach a new level, you're like, oh, well, okay, like this is it. And then the next year goes by and you're like, wow, that was not it. There's a deeper level. <laughs> so I've been finding that in myself, um, which has been really fun and really challenging. Um, I'd say this last semester was one of the funnest six months of my life and also one of the most challenging, but I'm starting to realize that when you truly are living out your dreams, that's going to be the case every single year. I'm going to come back on this podcast next year and you're going to be like, oh, how was season? And I'm going to be like, it was the hardest season of my life, but it was the most rewarding season of my life. That's just, it just comes with it. Absolutely. I had a really good conversation today with an XFL OC and we were talking about just the demeanor of the quarterback room that guys have to pull for each other. There has to be a clear QB1. QB2 has to support QB1, but QB2 has to have QB1 energy. QB2 has to have QB1 preparation. He has to have the relationship with the with the number one team on offense just like QB1 does. And when that happens, the best thing can happen for the team. Mm -hmm. And there are some quarterbacks out there that can't be QB2s. And the NFL teams know who they are because if they're not the starter, they don't want them in the room. They don't want them on Cam Newton. You don't want them on the team. No. Because they can't be a good QB2, even though QB2 is one play away from being a QB1. So I think that QB2 might be one of the top three or four most important positions on the team, even though QB2, you know, the fans don't want QB2 to play, but that that player is incredibly important. And they are looking for people that are mature, supportive, um, can, can be relatable to people, um, and, and can, in, in a way, be happy that QB1's doing a good job and QB1's doing a good job and be ready to go when QB1 isn't. So what you're saying is that the person who has to have the best character on the entire team is QB2. QB2 is tested for sure in in character, for sure. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Okay, so you've got new coaching staff. You've got new offense. um, You've got some good players returning. What do you you foresee for Louisville football for – Louisville fans that might be out there listening, um, what can they expect from your team this season when you play? You know, Florida State, Clemson, Notre Dame, North, you know, all these teams in the ACC. What can they expect? A very competitive team that is going to be in every single game, and I really believe it in my heart and. You know, not just being delusional, but actually seeing what I'm seeing. Like, we can really compete for the ACC championship. We have the coaching staff. We have the players. We're getting more transfers in, um, specifically on our defense, which has been awesome. Yeah, I mean, a team that is going to be dangerous. And what I love about it is um, some poll came out of, like, the percentages of what Vegas thinks who's going to win the ACC and Louisville's not even in the top five. So we have no expectations. Um, but we act, we actually have a lot of expectations in the city of Louisville because of the Brahms. So just a new energy, a new offense. Um, and with that, I think, you know, we showed last year we have a really dominant defense. Now, we had a lot of people, you know, just recently get drafted from that defense but I think if we can have a defense like we had last year and then a new vamped offense I mean there ain't no telling what we can do okay so you played in front of 80 90,000 people in Clemson and that is football country I mean there was more than a thousand um you know tents of fans tailgating before the game that place is just nuts 
I thought Nebraska was nuts, but I, I think Clemson is way Yeah, no, that was, that was insane. That was insane. What is it like? Like, what, share for the audience, maybe people that have never played in a football game in that kind of situation, the, the excitement and the challenges. I mean, your coach is yelling at you, and maybe you go three and out, or maybe you know something happens and they think it was your fault. How do, how do you deal with all that? When you're on center stage in front of that many people that are cheering against you? For me, I don't know how I'm wired like this. Um, the least amount of pressure I felt in all the games I played in was when I was playing at Clemson. I want, I've, always, I've never dreamed a dream of having the stadium half full. I've never dreamed a dream of playing against University of South Florida. I have dreamed a dream of playing in front of 80,000 people versus Clemson. So for me, it was, I felt so in alignment with like l- literally walking into many, 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 many dreams I've had. And so I don't know what it is, but I always play best against the best team um, and I feel the least amount of pressure because they're Clemson and we weren't expected to beat them and so anything you do on top of that is just like praised and glorified but if you lose everyone was expecting you to lose where when you're playing South Florida and the stadium is half capacity it's if you play a bad game then you're really you really are looked upon as trash so um i don't know i've always played better when there's no expectations and no, everyone's counting me out and it's the biggest stage compared to not that many people are there you're kind of pissed off not that many people are there you're playing against a lesser opponent that you're expected to win um it's just such a different feel. So, okay. So one of the things that you've done is you you started football camp last year in Louisville. You've been training um, high school kids, middle school kids, um, and quarterback coaching. Kind of share what is that? What perspective has that given you? Because most of the, most college football players spend all their time in the stadium or go to class, or hang out with friends. And here you are in the community dealing with normal people that have kids that want to, that want to be in the situation that you're in. Um, what has been your perspective on that? I think it's been so necessary for me because it's really humbled me in the sense of, you know, you're, you're not too big for anybody. And I think the athletes that are always just in the facility and... Um, maybe they're got the blue check on Instagram and got all these followers and are never really actually tapped into the community, but the community loves them. Um, I think they just view themselves as a superstar, untouchable, I'm better than you attitude where when you get into the community, when you work with kids, um, you know, kids kids treat you as their best friend and they've known you for an hour, right? So it just hum- it just humbled me of like, I I view myself as a big brother to, to the guys that I train. Um, and then at the football camp, it was just such a cool experience to see, honestly, how amazing my teammates did at coaching and then seeing the look on the kids' faces afterwards of just extreme satisfaction with, the last three hours of their life. Um, so yeah, just it kind of brings me back down to earth, I would say, in, in the best way possible of like, I'm not untouchable. I'm a regular guy. Um, that the whole purpose behind this big platform that we get is to go into the community and show everyone that you're just like them. You just were naive enough to believe in yourself to an extreme amount. 
you've shared with me before that um, coaching has helped you understand a little bit more about playing. Why don't you share a little bit about that? If you can teach it, I'd say 99% of things, if you can teach it, you can do it really well. So, and then it's just so many reminders to myself um, and so many extra reps. You know, um, it's funny. I try to articulate my words the best I can, but sometimes my clients are still very confused on what I'm trying to get them get out of them during the session. And the second I just show them it, that's all they need. That's all they need. They don't need any of my words. They just need to show me what I'm asking out of them, out of the drill. So, um, it's really, it's really brought a new level of awareness to how extremely important the basics are because that's all I'm teaching them. And, how the basics are, I'd say like 60, 70, 80% even of your play. You know, the Mahomes, Josh Allen stuff is less than 20% of all the plays, right? Um, you know, that, that shows up on the highlight film and everything like that. But I would say, I mean, if you look back on Josh Allen's year, I'd say probably 75% of his plays weren't the crazy stuff that we see, right? It's only about 25, 20%. Um, Might be less than that. Maybe less than that. Might be 10%. Right? So, um, you know, every young kid right now wants to have a sidearm and and wants to just lose their fundamentals. And I would say that the longer you've been in the game – the more you can mess with your fundamentals. Like Aaron Rodgers right now, when he's in OTAs with the Jets, he can do whatever the F he wants with his arm angle because it's so innately engraved in him when the lights are on and you got to make a throw, he's going to have the right, he's going to have the right mechanics. But a guy that's, you know, 8 to 18, you haven't put in the 10,000 hours. So if you're doing the 10,000 hours as if you're a 38-year-old veteran thinking you're hot shit, like you're not going to, you're, you're doing the wrong 10,000 hours. So I remember for me, and you, you took me to a million quarterback sessions, how insanely important it was for me to constantly um, be so focused on my mechanics and then it really wasn't until, I mean, I would say I was still focusing on my mechanics probably up until COVID. I mean, when I was three years into college that I felt comfortable enough to really like start messing with it a little bit. Um, and it, and that was because also I was thrown in the front yard in JoJo's yard in Nebraska where it was just like, let's... Let's figure out, you know, screw what it looks like. Let's figure out how to launch this thing, get a lot of power on it, um, spin it well. So, yeah, it's been it's been such a blessing to be able to um, get back to the basics within myself because, I mean, I'm getting paid to do extra reps with these kids. It's awesome. You mentioned your brother JoJo. Share with everybody what JoJo's up to. Yeah, he's in OTAs right now. Um, Going into his second year for the Colts, he is a linebacker and a long snapper and really anything you need. Um, he's so versatile and uh, he's, he's doing really well. He's killing it. How cool is it to have a big bro that's playing in the NFL? I mean, I think for me it's been necessary. Um, he has, he's always, he's always paved the way and shown me what's possible and I mean, I knew um, we had the capabilities of playing in the NFL when we were young, but um, to actually do it and to actually, you know, be on a 53-man roster, no question, no concerns for the first year. Like, that's pretty insane as an undrafted rookie. Um, You know, him being an All-American in Nebraska, like, so inspiring. Um, Yeah, he... 
he has made me up level more than anyone in my life. He He's challenged me more than anyone in my life. He has irked me more than anyone in my life. Um, That's what brothers are for. But yeah, I'm very, 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 very... It's a cheat code, honestly. That's what I see it as. Have JoJo. So we went to Kansas City. Uh, we met up in Kansas City uh, because of the draft and other things. We were at a popular... Um, barbecue place near the draft on Thursday night before and ran into one of my longtime clients, Nick Hardwick. How cool was that for you to see? And he, he actually announced one of the picks for the Chargers on Friday night. How cool is that for you to kind of reconnect with your childhood when you used to kind of hang with those guys? It was really, really cool. I think it was really necessary. Um, I think that was our blessing for showing up to Kansas City, was that experience. And for me, being able to talk to Nick Harbick and then also talk to Joe Staley, they are just, you can tell they're, they're, they're such men about how they live their lives. Um, how there's, there's order, there's discipline, there's structure. Um, there's this playfulness. There's this, and playfulness comes from confidence. So there's this deep level of confidence they have in themselves and the way they carry themselves um, was so, so inspiring to see. And I don't know, I just, I feel like I was a sponge that 40 minutes I had with them and um, it showed me that who you are and how you go about every single day, every single situation, they both seemed very emotionally sound. Um, and I think that's something that I can continue to get better at is like, you know, it feels like if adversity hits those guys, they're still the same, you know, they don't flinch. Right. And I think, um, we see too many people when adversity hits, we, we get really dramatic and we get really emotionally out of sync and it takes us a while to like catch ourselves and get ourselves back on track. And I see guys like that where they're just plows through every storm. Um, and it's, you know, it's the habits they've had in place. It's the thoughts they think. It's the people they surround themselves with. It's, um, you know, a combination of a lot of things. Um, but yeah, they, I can already, I don't even have to know their bank account numbers, but um, they are fine without football because they are both probably killing it in, in business. And um, knowing that football is a ticking time bomb, it encouraged me just like outside of football, like how I want to carry myself and live my life. Because they were both non-football players that we were talking to. Um, yeah, so just how much this translates over to being a businessman. I think it was Joe that uh, kind of gave you some tips on playing quarterback. What did he share with you? He just shared, like, don't try to be anyone else. He shared um, that Jimmy Garoppolo was a quarterback that he was so grateful to have quarter one through three. But when the fourth quarter came, um, he got a tight asshole. And that comes from... Wanting to be someone else, you know, Jimmy was behind Tom Brady for a couple years. So, I mean, that makes sense. Wanting to be that level of clutchness. And, you know, I can see that because a part of me um, wanted to have Malik Cunningham running running ability, you know. It's just natural. Like, I, I, will, I will never have Malik Cunningham running ability, right? But I am still an efficient runner. I showed that versus Virginia, right? So, I can still get it. So it's it's not trying to be this perfect person. It's not idolizing someone else's ability. And it's truly being yourself and knowing that actually being yourself is not going to be enough at certain moments and accepting that. That, hey, guys, like, yes, I am your quarterback of your organization, but I'm also a human. And I am going to fall short at times and I am going to disappoint this team at times. And having that level of grace in advance and knowing that and then just doing everything you possibly can to make those moments as minuscule as possible. 
Well, one of the things that I think is everybody's superpower is being you. Mm -hmm. And when you start trying to be somebody else, you lose power. And the world teaches us and shows us and tells us that who we are is not enough. But our superpower is when we connect to who we really are. Agree, disagree? Agree. Okay. I've interviewed you a couple times for Pro Mindset. Why don't you take the mic and interview Dad mm. and ask me whatever you want to ask me. I love that. All right, Pro Mindset Podcast. This is Brock Doman here. Um, I cannot wait to interview my dad. So... Being a sports agent for, what, 30 plus years now? Yes, sir. Um, you've seen so much success and so much failure. Um, who is, what attributes are the type of people that you're looking to represent? Well, I think the people that I'm looking to represent are guys that first and foremost, have tremendous belief in who they are. They're comfortable in their own skin. Because the NFL kind of discovers and uncovers the frauds. And those are the guys that get cut first, regardless of talent, unless they're like a first, you know, top 30 pick or something. The second thing I'm looking for is guys that can um, hold on to their dream, even though their circumstances are not in alignment with their dream. Um, a lot of guys over the weekend that got drafted, their dream and what happened was not the same. You know, there's probably 100 guys that were expecting to go in the first round. There's at least 110 or 120 players that over the course of the last year, since last year's draft, were projected at one point in time to be first rounders. Maybe it was in September. Maybe it was in July. Maybe it was preseason, but maybe it was a month ago. They didn't get in, they didn't get their name called uh, because of a forfeiture by the um, Dolphins. There was only thirty one draft picks that went in the first round. So you're constantly not in alignment with your dream, and so what happens is a lot of guys quit in their own head. And I would say the third thing I'm looking for is that you know there's a lot of like all these guys that got drafted. They're all good dudes. They're all good dudes. Maybe one bad apple, but there's majority of these guys are good people. Mm -hmm. The guys that sign as undrafted free agents, good people, and they have lots of talent. But the reason why I have Pro Mindset Podcast is because the differentiator is really what's between the ears. And now that I've studied the, the mind, I've realized it's really what's in your heart. Not a lot of guys can go there. Yeah. Not a lot of guys can... Uh, deal with the adversity of showing up for OTAs and the coach says, hey, man, where'd you go to school? And the player's like, well, dude, you drafted me. You should know where I went to school. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the front office drafted the player and the coach wanted somebody else. So the coach has an ax to grind to want to show the front office that, hey, man, this guy ain't that good. Mm -hmm. And so he takes it out on the player. If the player doesn't have belief and play out of his heart, he's done. He's done. He's not going to make it. Um, and so because of the, the NFL is like a pressure cooker. So if you don't have a turbocharged mindset, you won't make it. Nick Hardwick had that. Mm -hmm. The guys that I've, Ryan Lilger didn't even get drafted. He had it. So what I'm looking for is the guys that have like a turbo mindset to be able to handle whatever comes their way because you know from playing college football there's a lot of bullshit that comes your way. 100%. Another question I have for you. You have been, yeah, at one point you were, well, considered a top 25 agent? Top 10. Top 10 agent. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Okay, so at some point you were a top 10, you are in the 1% of agency. And... Um, you have been quite a, you've been through quite a bit of, um, career change in the last five to seven years, obviously still being an agent, but focusing on other aspects of your life too. What, what is that challenge brought out of you? 
Well, I think one of the things, very similar to you coaching and training quarterbacks, uh, you get very myopic and hyper-focused when you're just in the locker room as a player. So when I was doing agency, and that was my whole identity, honestly, everything I did was reflective of who I, who I signed, did they go to the Senior Bowl? Did they get invited to the Combine? How high did they get drafted? Did they make the team? And that was my identity. And so like... So you took on other people's success as your success. Yeah. I mean, that's... Most agents, that's the way it works. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I learned this a long time ago where I'd be talking to a young man and he's like, hey, he had it down to me and another guy. And I'd say, hey man, what do you, what's your decision? He says, well, I'm going to go with so-and-so's agent. And I said, well, who's... Who's the agent? And he would say like, oh, I got like T.O.'s agent. Okay. I'm like, well, who's the, I don't know. He didn't know the name. So what ends up happening in the agent community is that you, a lot of guys don't have an identity because they are who they represent. Mm. And I think after a period of time, especially with you and your brother going up the ranks with college football and whatnot, I wanted to have my own ident- identity. And I wanted to make sure that I could be successful without that connection to just an athlete. And so that's what I've done. I've tried mm-hmm. other things. I've done some other things. I've done this podcast. I'm doing keynote speaking. I'm uh, close to finishing a book. All about mindset and everything that I've learned. You're also uh, in real estate. Do real estate. I do other things, yeah. right? So it's like it's been incredibly valuable that um, it's made me a better agent. Because I've got a different, I've got a, a wider perspective of the world instead of um, just who I represent. And a, a, a new level of unattachment. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So one of the things that, um, if you look at the roller coaster emotions that an agent has in that December, January window you really feel good about yourself or not, depending on who decides to sign with you. And then after, you know, after uh, draft weekend, you're like, man, I'm good. Or you feel like shit because you didn't, your guys didn't get drafted as high as you were hoping. And then at the end of training camp, when they have final cuts, I mean, it's a massacre. I mean, there's a thousand guys cut in final cuts. A thousand. Across the league? Across the league. Okay, it's 37 times 32, whatever that number is. It's a big number. Um, maybe 1,200, something like that. All those wow. guys, all those players have their dreams shattered. Now, some of them end up on practice squads and IRs and things like that. But it's like you experience that trauma with your clients because you're right there. You're not on the field with them. You're not wearing the helmet. You're not playing for them. But you're, you're, you're like their partner in their career. And when their career is shattered and you call a team and go, hey, man, you know, I had a client one time that um, I called up the team and said, hey, how'd it go? Would you guys be interested in bringing him back on the practice squad? He said, oh, no, we have, we have no plans for that. I didn't even, didn't even ask him why because it was just like it was so negative. Yeah. So it's like here's my guy <clears throat> that I've been partnering with and coaching and mentoring and he goes to training camp and doesn't get it done. Mm -hmm. so guess what that reflects on me yeah I can see that being tough Um, my last question did you could you have ever foreseen where Jojo and I are at now and how has this journey been of being our dad through all this great question One of these days, you're going to learn that being a dad is the coolest thing, okay? Um, I didn't know if you guys had the ability to make it as far as you had or you have, but you guys were on the right track most of the time. I would say we didn't. We really grew into it. You grew into it. It's a, it's a survival game, and I shared with you um, when you guys were thinking about playing college ball, it's hard. I was real transparent with you guys. Hey, it's not it's not a party. You know, it's not a, just a girl card to show up on campus, um, <clears throat> go hang out at the beach. No, it's hard. And you know, co- isn't college football hard? Mm-hmm. A lot of guys can't do it, mm-hmm. right? And so I think 
over time, I was able to share with you the ugly side of football, the hard side of football, and you guys didn't flinch. And so that's why, that's, that's when I realized you guys got a chance. You know, when JoJo tore his ACL the second time and holy smokes, I mean, the world, the, you know, the Nebraska fan base quit on him, the coaches quit on him, the players quit on him. I had some real hard conversations with your brother about now's a good time to quit. Nobody's going to blame you now. And he didn't quit. So when guys don't, you know, ch- check it in, when when it gets really hard, they got a shot to make it. Because the NFL, every NFL player that's played 10 or 15 years has been through a tremendous amount of adversity mm. that the fans haven't seen. They've been asked to take pay cuts. They've been, da- they've been they've, the teams have drafted somebody in the first round to take their place. They've had to survive all those kind of things. I think that there is, I think that it's necessary for not everyone to know how much adversity you've been through because then, because then there's naturally this chip on your shoulder of being misunderstood and how, you know, the only people that are going to know really what you've been through is you and your family. Um, and sometimes even not even your family. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that that's so necessary. But um, yeah, that's all I got. Okay, I want to thank you, bro. Great job. I want to wish you nothing but the best in 2023 at Louisville. I know you're going to be ready. And um, most most likely you're going to get an opportunity. You're just not going to know when it's going to come. Could happen in July. Could happen in October. Um, But just capitalize on that opportunity when you get it. Brock Toller is coming back in 2023. <laughs> I want to thank you for tuning in to Pro Mindset Podcast. If you enjoyed the listen, please leave a five-star rating. If the message was a vibration you connected with and you have any friends, family, or colleagues who would benefit, then please share this episode with them. You can follow Pro Mindset Podcast on the following social media platforms. Instagram and YouTube, Pro Mindset Podcast. Twitter and Facebook, Pro Mindset Pod. LinkedIn, Pro Mindset. We will drop our shows, Pro Mindset Podcasts, every Wednesday morning, and we invite you to listen and subscribe. Also, don't hesitate to check out our archives to listen to previous shows. And finally, I encourage you to embrace a Pro Mindset truth from today's show. It just might be the key to unlock the pro inside you.